Thanks for joining me here at NTD Business. A number of things I'd like to talk about. First, the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission today sued Coinbase, accusing the largest U.S. cryptocurrency exchange of operating illegally because it failed to first register with the regulator. The lawsuit is the SEC's second in two days against a major crypto exchange following its case against Binance, the world's largest cryptocurrency exchange, and its founder, Changpeng Zhao. Both civil cases are part of SEC Chair Gary Gensler's push to assert jurisdiction over the crypto markets, which he today again labeled, quote, a wild west of investing and protect investors while shoring up their trust in capital markets. Gensler says the crypto markets are undermining that trust, and he says it undermines overall capital markets. Crypto companies, including Coinbase, have said SEC rules are unclear, and the regulator is overreaching by asserting oversight of their industry. Coinbase's general counsel said in a statement that the company will continue operating as usual and has demonstrated commitment to compliance. Ten U.S. states led by California are also taking legal action against Coinbase for alleged securities law violations. Meanwhile, Coinbase customers pulled more than $57 million from the exchange within a couple of hours of the filing. This is according to data firm Nansen. In its complaint filed in Manhattan federal court, the SEC said Coinbase has since at least 2019 made billions of dollars by operating as a middleman on crypto transactions while evading disclosure requirements meant to protect investors. The SEC said Coinbase traded at least 13 crypto assets that are securities that should have been registered. That's including tokens like Solana, Cardano and Polygon. Coinbase, founded in 2012, recently served more than 108 million customers and ended March with $130 billion of customer crypto assets and funds on its balance sheet. Transactions generated 75% of its $3 billion of net revenue last year. Today's complaint addressed several aspects of Coinbase's business, including Coinbase Prime, which routes orders, Coinbase Wallet, which lets investors access liquidity, and the Coinbase Earn Staking Service. Today's SEC lawsuit seeks civil fines, the recouping of ill-gotten gains, and injunctive relief. The SEC had warned Coinbase in March that charges might be coming. It said the company was fully aware that its business was subject to federal securities laws, but it ignored it. In the Binance case, the SEC accused the exchange of inflating trade volumes, diverting customer funds, improperly commingling assets, failing to keep wealthy U.S. customers off its platform, and misleading customers about its controls. Binance pleaded to defend vigorously against lawsuit and said the case reflected the SEC's misguided and conscious refusal to provide clarity and guidance to the crypto industry. Coinbase's friction with Gensler dates to 2021, when the SEC threatened to sue if Coinbase were to let users earn interest by lending digital assets. The company scrapped the idea. And here to talk to me is Thomas Hogan, Senior Research Faculty at AIER. He's done a lot of research in the crypto space. So the SEC slapping Coinbase and Binance, of course, with a long list of the allegations. What I'm wondering is, Will they still be able to operate after this? Yeah, that's right. The SEC has charged Coinbase and Binance with a number of things. The the main uh, issue being the facilitating the trade of unregistered securities. And if they are found guilty of these crimes, then no, they will not be able to uh, to allow trading in the United States. Binance is a, an international entity that has a subsidiary, Binance US, and so they might end up just closing the US subsidiary. Coinbase is based out of the United States, but they've been talking with international regulators in the UK, Dubai, and Hong Kong about potentially moving, and so this lawsuit could push them abroad. Coinbase uh, feels that the SEC might be overreaching. I mean, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, do, do they have a point? Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. The SEC has been completely opaque and actually contradictory in some of the claims that they have made against a number of other companies about what is and what is not a security. So they've charged several companies with issuing unregistered securities, but now they're charging Coinbase with 
facilitating the trade of unregistered securities, but they won't say what is and what is not a security. Gary Gensler, the chair of the SEC, has contradicted himself a number of times, sometimes saying that Ethereum, the second largest crypto token, is a security, sometimes saying it's not, and then recently before Congress saying that he didn't know. And so it's very difficult for the exchanges to really know what the law is or how they could be able to comply. I mean, Gary Gensler said today, we don't need more digital currency. We, we already have digital currency, he says, the U.S. dollar, the euro, the Japanese yen. I mean, what is he saying here? So it seems like uh, Gary Gensler is really trying to punish the cryptocurrency industry and potentially drive it out of the United States. As you mentioned, you know, he and a number of other uh, politicians and people in Washington, D.C. just don't see any value in the cryptocurrency industry. But normally in the United States, that's not a reason to just disqualify an industry or force it out of the country, there needs to be some problem with it. I mean, if people want to use this product, there's no reason they shouldn't be able to do that. And a lot of people see this as an amazing new technology akin to the budding of the internet. This is like the internet of money. And so just because Gary Gensler doesn't like this, it doesn't mean he should be able to make it illegal for Americans to use it. I mean, this is pure speculation, but is there any other motivation other than the pure legal aspect? Well, I, you know, I think this whole area is uh, getting very political. So cryptocurrency for a while had been something that kind of appealed to both Republicans and Democrats. Uh, it's something that for a lot of people that are in the lower income range that don't have a bank account but want access to be able to ho hold money uh, in electronic form or possibly people that are immigrants that want to be able to send money back home. This is something that was really appealing to people. But lately it's gotten very political with the Republicans favoring crypto and the Democrats being against it. And so this seems like a very political move by the SEC. Some people have speculated that Gary Gensler has, you know, higher hopes of becoming uh, the head of the Treasury or something like that. I don't really know. But it doesn't seem like it's really being done to protect Americans as the SEC is supposed to be doing. And you touched on this earlier, but let me get you to further elaborate. So the SEC suing Coinbase one day, a single day after suing Binance. But it, it, I can't help but, you know, spe suspect that perhaps the SEC is singling something. Maybe, maybe you can talk a little bit on this. The SEC has been on the warpath against crypto this entire year. Um, last year, the regulatory agencies were kind of waiting for Congress to make some kind of rule so that uh, direct them for what to do with the crypto industry. But this year, the SEC has just started charging uh, a number of companies with issuing unregistered securities. They had warned Coinbase about a month ago that they were going to sue them. And now we have this lawsuit that they've sued them for uh, facilitating the trade of unregistered securities. But when when they, uh, when they Coinbase received the Wells notice, the warning that, that the SEC was going to sue them, you know, they, they came out and publicly said, we've been trying to work with the SEC. We've met with them 30 times and asked them for direction about how we can come into compliance, and they've refused to give us any answers. We've asked them, and many lawsuits have challenged the SEC about what is a security and what is not, so that they can know which cryptos are legal and which ones are not. But the SEC is refusing to tell them, and they've just decided to make this a political issue that they, rather than coming up with clear and transparent rules, are just punishing companies without even telling them what is legal and what is not. Yeah, I mean, I guess uh, the security aspect is, is the main concern here, but there's a number of al other allegations as well on top of that. Uh, do they have merit? You know, it, it, it's hard to say, and I'm, I'm not a lawyer, and I, I'm, I, know, I don't know uh, if I should speculate. There is some evidence uh, for Binance, where the SEC has in quotes from internal memos where people had said, uh, we may be operating a, an unregistered securities exchange in the United States. It's hard to tell. It may have been just a joke or we don't know the context. Um, but definitely there's a little bit more um, 
question about the Binance situation. For Coinbase, Coinbase has been trying to be the main regulated exchange in the United States. They've been trying to get the regulators to give them clarity about whether they are or are not in violation of the law, and regulators have been refusing to do so. In fact, Coinbase has sued the SEC to ask whether the SEC will actually provide a definition of what, an is, not a, what is or is not a security. And the SEC is refusing to even answer whether they will or will not provide a definition. Uh, so that's before the courts right now. And so um, we'll, we'll see whether the SEC will be forced to define a security probably before we know for sure about this uh, question of whether Coinbase is trading in unregistered securities. Yeah, I mean, th that you have a point there. Gary Gensler says it's been clear for a long time. Um, but anyways, you mentioned earlier that the end goal here may be to drive out cryptocurrency from the U.S. Is that really the end goal here? And what are the, what are the pros and cons? Yeah, you know, it's 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 hard to tell because the the regulators for a while seemed like they were going to allow the cryptocurrency industry to develop and just just in the last few months, you know, since early this year have really been going after it and not been clear about what the rules are. The SEC has refused to make a rule about what is and is not a security. They are supposed to follow a notice and comment rulemaking process where they provide a draft of a rule or regulation to the public. The public makes comments, and then the SEC issues a final rule based on the feedback they get from the public. However, in this case, they have refused to do that, and so it's not clear what their intent is. It seems like they've been going after companies without even telling what the law is. And so if they are refusing to provide a, a fair and transparent uh, legal system, then companies are just not going to operate in the United States. And this can be a problem for Americans that want to be able to trade cryptocurrencies or own cryptocurrencies. The, the major exchange that crashed last year, FTX, was a foreign exchange with a domestic subsidiary, but they were doing most of the trading on the foreign exchange because they couldn't get any clarity from U.S. financial regulators. And so it seems like pushing these companies out of the United States is going to potentially make it more risky for Americans and not less. And just one more quick thought from, from you. Big picture wise, would this have any impact on the U.S. economy? I. I think that the cryptocurrency industry is going to be a major developing industry, and I think driving it out of the United States will be bad for individuals that want to trade cryptocurrencies, but also bad for the U.S. Uh, economy in terms of all the jobs lost and the, the technological development. I think a lot of people are comparing this to the early days of the Internet when we had the debate over should the government be running the Internet, should they be regulating it. I think we probably everyone believes that we're better off that the government did not take over the regulation of the entire internet. And I think probably the same is true now that the cryptocurrency wants to be the internet of finance and money um, and putting the government in charge of that or driving it out of the United States is not gonna be good for Americans. I mean, it's already just, you know, since 2009, a multi-trillion dollar industry that's creating tens of thousands of jobs, maybe hundreds of thousands in the United States in the coming decades. And so we should want that. That would be really good for America. Yeah, and to your point, I think the the government is also thinking of extending regulation into the AI space. That's also something that's developing right now alongside. But thank you so much today, Thomas. It was a pleasure speaking to you. Yeah, thanks. Glad to be on. And Apple now has an augmented reality headset. The company announced Vision Pro yesterday. At Apple's annual Worldwide Developers Conference, a long list of new features and products were announced. And here to talk to me is Burton Kelso, expert on everything tech. So the Apple conference that we had yesterday, a, a lot of people highly anticipating that. Um, in comparison to before, how, how do you think this one went? How, what are your feelings about it? I think this one kind of went flat because people had higher expectations as far as the products and software updates that Apple was going to offer. I mean, you saw some key things like the ability to leave video messages with um, FaceTime. But then as far as their VR goggles, I think it went flat, especially with the high price of $3,500 for a set of VR headsets where you have other ones on the market that are considerably lower. So I see the comments on the internet and people are making uh, comments about the high price 
for virtual reality goggles, uh, and then just the the products and the software that Apple's rolling out. As long as the features, comparing them to stuff that Samsung has had for a long time, so a bit of disappointment with that. Yeah, I wanted to talk to you about that, but first, uh, let me ask you something about the MacBook Air, the 15-inch one that was announced yesterday. I mean, alongside all of the features that's iconic with the MacBook Air, I think one of the biggest features for me personally, at least, is the price tag. It used to be at $999, right? Now this new version that's being launched is over $1,000. I think it's uh, $1,199, somewhere around that. I mean, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, for students, the $999 mark is really key here. I think the I think people are willing to pay a little bit more for a larger MacBook Air. I mean, the 15 inch screen has got high definition, and I think for years people have wanted a 15 inch MacBook Air uh, as opposed to the 13 inch because you're seeing more people working mobile, and if you're able to offer a 15 inch lightweight laptop, people are going to embrace it, no matter if there's a slight price increase or not. So alongside the new products that were announced, uh, a new software update, iOS 17, was announced. What are your thoughts on that? It, um, it's it, it's almost like I'm speechless about it because you know, and every time there's a new iOS update that comes out, there's like features that are included for your iPhone that are just revolutionary. But now it's like they added stuff that they forgot to put in the iOS 16, and it's just filler. And I mean, it's really not exciting and it doesn't really make you want to download the latest iOS update when it's available because there's nothing to look forward to other than security updates that obviously will keep your phone safe and secure. I mean, a lot of the features are already uh, available on Samsung devices. And, you know, it's one of those issues where maybe I want to stop spending as much money on my iPhone and go out and purchase a more cheaper Samsung or Android device. I mean, what, what are some of the features that were, were announced yesterday in terms of iOS 17 that you felt was sort of a letdown? <laughs> the whole feature of you rotating your phone horizontally and then all of a sudden it's like a, an alarm clock. You know, I mean, that's, you know, that's all right. I mean, it's been, been with Samsung. But I think one of the great features that would be available is um, that will be avail available for iOS devices is the whole uh, method of FaceTime where you can leave a video message with somebody. I think that's really good because FaceTime has been really limited as to what you can do with the app. If you call somebody, you don't get anybody, but if you're able to call, you're moving more towards uh, a futuristic idea of us getting away from landlines and moving more to our mobile phones for communication. And one thing I wonder if this is significant because yesterday they completed their Apple Silicon uh, transition do you think there's anything significant there not really uh i i really don't unfortunately so um you know <laughs> it's it, watching the whole event it's you know it's just like you're in anticipation and then you just walk away feeling a little empty because you know it's just little tidbits that were thrown in with the whole uh whole uh conference so as for the augmented reality headset, Tim Cook uh, unveiled this in the format of one more thing. I mean, I think that's a, a bit interesting, but did it live up to the one more thing type of uh, format? No, because it's one more year that we have to wait for the augmented uh, reality headset to come out. And unfortunately it was supposed to be released last September. So, you know, there's more of a delay for the augmented re reality headset and it doesn't really add anything um, to the picture. And I think a lot of people were think, hoping that the augmented reality headset would entice more people to get into the metaverse, but the high price tag is going to stop people unless this is kind of somewhat of a beta to test it out in the real world and then release a uh, more cost-effective um, version. But again, there's nothing that's really tying people to get into the metaverse. And that was the big hope with the uh, augmented reality headset. You know, there's this uh, notion that when Apple does something, it's more likely to catch on. Do you think this could be the case with augmented reality? I don't think so, no. I think uh, maybe the ship has sailed for the metaverse and all things meta. Maybe for a select few of people that can uh, purchase 
the augmented reality headset from Apple, and maybe they have an Oculus. But, uh, you know, if it would have been released last year, I would say yes, that would have enticed more people to get involved. But no one's really talking about the metaverse now. So it's like, you know, too, just a little too late to catch the boat as far as getting people involved in the metaverse and virtual reality. I mean, to your point, right, Apple usually comes out with products that are later or features that are later than what the tech industry has already had. So I guess the timing sort of suits Apple. But um, I'm wondering, like, what would make people want to wear this all the time? I mean, who, who's the demographic here? People with a lot of money based on the price tag. And then also uh, just people that are involved in tech people who like to have the latest and greatest and be able to see how we're pushing the envelope as far as technology is concerned. Um, you know, it's not like past Apple products, like say an Apple Watch or an iPhone that are geared to, towards everyday people. I mean, there are many uses for an Apple Watch and there's many uses for uh, your iPhone and even iPad and of course, you know, your Apple computer products. But for augmented reality, I mean, you really are limited what you can do with this device other than sit in the comfort of your office or home and enjoy a virtual world. I mean, I think the price tag itself suggests that it's it might be targeted towards a more professional demographic, $3,500. I mean, not everybody has that money to throw away. So if it were around, let's say $800, would you think, would that make you feel like it has a better chance? I definitely think a lower price tag around $800 would make more people go out and purchase this headset um, because it's more in line with what other or other virtual reality products that you have out there. I mean, you know, the price tag definitely puts it in a greater stratosphere and it may have the features, but I think for just everyday consumers, it's not something that you would just rush out and get. Uh, it's something that you would have to, you know, think about before you made the purchase. And I think that's crucial to a lot of the Apple products. I mean, for the most part, they are pricier, but at the same time, they are within the budget of most people and they're able to get out and enjoy them. Okay, just one final thing. Is there any way this headset will convince you to go out and buy it? What, what would it have to have for you to buy this? Oh, I'd like, a, uh, I'd like a demo of it, you know, get my own copy, but realistically, it would have to be the price tag for me to go out and enjoy it. Because I mean, I've had Oculus, I've had other VR headsets on, and they are very, they're very fun to deal with. But just to, I mean, you're talking about a couple of MacBooks for that price. <laughs> so yeah, I, th I think price tag is going to be a huge factor as far as people purchasing it, because it's got a lot of cool features. You can't deny that. I mean, it's, it's incredible. But yeah, that price, you're like, oh man, I don't know. Yeah, I, I think a, a lot of people might agree with you, but thank you so much for speaking with me today, Burton. Always great to see you. Always great to see you too, Don. Thank you. Apple CEO Tim Cook says that augmented reality can unlock experiences like nothing we've ever seen before. He says that in the same way that the Mac introduced us to personal computing and the iPhone introduced us to mobile computing, Apple Vision Pro will introduce us to spatial computing.